on this Tuesday night. He was guilty, he acknowledged that. That's all I needed to hear. The driver in the Humboldt Broncos crash admits he's guilty. Why didn't he stop? That's my only question. CBC learns new details about the moments leading up to the deadly crash. This is a humanitarian crisis, a crisis of the heart and a crisis of the soul. Donald Trump takes his pitch for a wall to prime time. Cue the fact checkers. Can the president justify his so-called border crisis? I'll never step on a WestJet plane ever again. Stranded on the tarmac for hours, then abandoned overnight. Ottawa has a plan to protect passengers, but would it have helped this travel nightmare? This is the national. It was a tragedy that had a deep and immediate impact on people right across the country. And today, nine months after the Humboldt Broncos bus collided with a transport truck, confirmation it was no accident but a criminal act. The driver of the truck accepting responsibility for what he did. Jazz Carrot Singh Sidhu pleaded guilty to 16 counts of dangerous driving causing death, along with 13 counts of dangerous driving causing bodily harm. Tonight, we'll tell you what we've learned about what happened at that intersection on April the 6th, including how fast Sidhu was going. But let's start with Bonnie Allen, who was at the courthouse. It was over in a matter of minutes. Jaskarat Singh Sidhu stood up in court and said five words. I plead guilty, Your Honor. His lawyer, Mark Brayford, explains why. Mr. Sidhu advised me, I don't want to make things any worse. Uh, I can't make things any better, but I certainly don't want to make them worse by having a trial. Sadu blew through a stop sign colliding with the humble Broncos team bus. He wanted the families to know that he's devastated by uh, the grief that he's caused them. And uh, he's overwhelmed by the expressions of sympathy uh, and kindness that some of the families and players have uh, expressed to him in spite of the fact that their grief is entirely his fault. Scott Thomas's son Evan died in the crash. Outside court, he choked back tears. All I've ever told my kids is, speaking about accountability and responsibility and for to hear him use his own words to plead guilty that's a powerful powerful second for sure Sadu didn't have to plead guilty he could have mounted a defense Canada's chief justice has said even good drivers are occasionally subject to momentary lapses of attention Dangerous driving causing death carries a maximum sentence of 14 years in prison. But time behind bars doesn't matter to Scott Thomas. When he said guilty to me, I have my, my closure. If he sends a day, if he spends 10 years, time is irrelevant. He was guilty. Tom and Michelle Strajnitsky want a sentence that sends a message. Their son Ryan was paralyzed in the crash. While I don't want to vilify him, I do want this to be a lesson, a lesson learned. Um, I don't think a slap on the wrist is necessarily the way to go. However, I don't believe fundamentally that he's the only one responsible. The Strajnitskys want seatbelts on buses and mandatory truck driver training. The humble Broncos hockey team issued a statement commending Singh Sadu for taking responsibility and sparing survivors the anguish of rehashing the tragedy in court. But that will still happen during a five-day sentencing hearing at the end of January. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Melfort, Saskatchewan. And we're also getting a better sense of what happened in the moments just before the crash. CBC News has obtained a copy of the agreed statement of facts between the Crown and the defense, and that document is based on the RCMP's extensive investigation. Our Susan Ormiston has read it and is here to walk us through what happened that day. Well, Ian, the main thing is that the truck driver simply did not stop. Now, most families had always believed that was the case. Now it's a fact. Back in April, Sadu was hauling peat, traveling west at a speed between 86 to 96 kilometers an hour in daylight. He did not heed an oversized stop sign and its light, instead barreling right through the intersection. There were no skid marks for his truck. The driver failed to recognize the hazard and took minimal or no action in an effort to avoid the collision. Coming north, bus driver Glenn Dirksen 
was traveling 96 to 107 kilometers an hour, braking hard only at the last second, but with both vehicles at highway speed, he couldn't avoid the truck and T-bone the trailer. Traveling west. Or Shortly after the crash, I drove the route of the truck driver, and there are trees to the south, but as we saw, they are well back from the intersection, and as the statement says, the trees would not have obstructed Mr. Sidhu's ability to observe the bus approaching if he had stopped to check for traffic as required. His first goal. In the chaos after the crash, Scott Thomas arrived at the scene looking for his son Evan. What the police officers told me, and I don't know what the investigations got so far, but he said, yeah, the semi-driver blew right through the stop sign. He said he couldn't see it because the sun was in his eyes. I look over my shoulder and this is just my opinion, but the sun wasn't in his eyes. That's now confirmed. The sun wasn't a factor. Road and weather conditions were good, and Sudhu was not distracted by a cell phone. Which leaves the aching question from parent Tom Stresnitsky, whose son Ryan was paralyzed in the crash. As soon as kids can walk, our parents and teachers teach us, red means stop, green means go, look both ways. Why didn't he stop? That's my only question. What was he in a hurry to do? Was his boss making him uh, make a time limit to get the load off? Or, like, those are my questions. Now, there will be more details in a reconstruction report, which hasn't been released yet, and we'll also learn more about his driving record. But, Ian, what is still missing is an explanation from the driver himself why or how he failed to stop, and we may never get that. Still such an agonizing question. Susan, thank you very much. There had been tragedy at this intersection before. Six people from one family died in a crash there in 1997. And after the Humboldt Broncos disaster, Saskatchewan commissioned a study to try to make it safer and has now promised to follow through. The province has committed to removing trees for better visibility, as well as installing rumble strips, which make a car vibrate when you drive over them, and putting up bigger stop signs and road markers ahead of those signs. The Broncos memorial site will also be moved. And a final note to the story tonight, we can tell you that crash survivor Lane Matichuk, who spent six months in hospital, has returned to the ice for the first time. His body a little shaky, but his spirit certainly strong. Lane's dad, Kevin, posted a couple of videos on Twitter today showing his son building his muscles back up by skating and taking some shots. Lane suffered a brain injury in the crash. He spent a month in a coma. He was released from hospital three months ago, and his family says he keeps getting stronger. And so, Rosemary, amid all this tragedy, there are a few flashes of hope like that one. But I want to go back to something we heard from one of the parents about how they hope the sentence for the driver sends a message. And I think that that message presumably isn't just for the driver, but, but really all of us about how a lapse in attention when you're driving can be so catastrophic. Yeah, it's so true. And seeing all those families react just reminds me again how brave they've been through all of this. Just incredible. Mm -hmm. To Washington now and the Oval Office, where Donald Trump made the first primetime television address of his presidency. All major U.S. networks carried it. And the goal was to build a case for his signature campaign promise. You know it, a wall across the U.S.-Mexican border. For more on the address and politics around it, we turn to Keith Boak. Okay, Keith, what stood out to you from that nine and a half minutes or so that the president spoke? Well, we were told to expect, Rosie, that it would have a heavy concentration on the humanitarian aspects of what is going on with asylum seekers at the border, and in fact, it did. He talked a lot about the kinds of things that Congress, Democrats and Republicans, along with the White House, have in common, a concern for the health of the people there and the need to improve their situation. But when it came to what is, in fact, the sticking point in this government shutdown, which is the wall, he didn't seem to move much. Let's have a listen to what he had to say then. Finally, as part of an overall approach to border security, law enforcement professionals have requested $5.7 billion for a physical barrier. At the request of Democrats, it will be a steel barrier rather than a concrete wall. This barrier is absolutely critical to border security. It's also what our professionals at the border want and need. This is just common sense. Well, maybe it is. Uh, he did say, though, that the wall will be paid for 
by the advantages the American economy will have from the new trade deal with Canada and Mexico, which of course is not how that deal is going to work. So in fact, he is still a far cry from keeping his election promise that he would build a wall and have Mexico pay for it. Okay, and of course, right after he spoke, the Democrats had their turn as well. Let's uh, play a little bit of what their response was. President Trump must stop holding the American people hostage, must stop manufacturing a crisis, and must reopen the government. So it was about 20 minutes, all told, of primetime TV handed over without filters to political leaders. And Keith, it sure put U.S. networks in a very difficult position. Well, sure. I mean, they felt they had to do it. But they also felt that there was a risk that if Trump uh, got into his kind of red meat rally mode, that they would really just be giving a megaphone uh, to the president to sell a political line that might, in fact, also be stuffed with half-truths and nonsense. Uh, some of the times in the past when he's talked about it, things he said about the wall just don't make sense. That didn't really happen tonight. Not everything he said was true, uh, but it was a much more subdued Donald Trump. Uh, one who actually didn't feel as comfortable in that format as he might have in front of a rally. Uh, but nevertheless, it wasn't an out-of-control rant about how bad the wall is, how bad uh, illegal immigrants are, and so on. But whether it actually changed anything is the real question. Yeah. And it's not obvious to me that anybody's position has changed at all tonight. He's still stuck on nearly $6 billion for the wall, and it appears that Democrats are still determined not to give it to him. They meet tomorrow. We'll see whether anything has changed. Okay, Keith Bogue in Washington tonight. Thanks, Keith. Appreciate Thank it. Congress, uh, as Keith mentioned, has so far blocked Trump's demand for the border wall. And meanwhile, with the result of all this, the standoff has led to a partial shutdown of the U.S. government. It has lasted now 18 days and counting. Trump threatened to invoke emergency powers to fund his wall. That didn't happen. But in fact, for Trump, tonight's rhetoric is remarkably consistent. You have drugs, you have human trafficking. Human trafficking, drugs. Caravan after caravan of illegal aliens. For Donald Trump, this has long been a crisis, an emergency, an invasion. invasion. I don't care what they say. I don't care what the fake media says. That's an invasion of our country. But the invasion is more like an illusion. In recent years, apprehensions at the U.S. border have hovered around three to 400,000. That's a dramatic decline from the peak of 1.6 million in the year 2000. And this is despite having twice the number of agents now patrolling the border. More agents are chasing fewer violations. Fact is, illegal crossings haven't been this quiet since the early 1970s. What is growing is the number of people showing up legally to claim asylum, particularly families and children, a trend driven by poverty, gang violence, and political instability in South and Central America. It's overwhelming U.S. immigration courts and shelters. But instead of shoring up the system, the White House has deployed misleading statistics. Nearly 4,000 known or suspected terrorists come into our country illegally. Do you know where those 4,000 people, where they're captured? The airports. I, the the State number. Department says there hasn't been any terrorists Certainly, that they found coming across the southern border. Air. The Trump administration has focused on displays of deterrence, sparking controversy by splitting migrant children from their parents and sending the military to the border. Barbed wire used properly can be a beautiful sight. And it's pushed asylum seekers back to Mexico to wait in squalid camps. It's adding to a humanitarian crisis that no wall can solve. Now, Trump says that all of this, this stalemate in Congress, could be broken by a 45-minute meeting, 45 minute meeting. But it is unlikely, in fact, that the announcement today will do anything to break that logjam in U.S. Congress over funding. Uh, that means that for hundreds of thousands of federal workers, there's still no paychecks, no end in sight. As Paul Hunter explains, the impact is growing every day. In the U.S. Capitol, it's do not enter, stay out, closed for business. Not just shuttered museums, but effectively empty sidewalks, even at rush hour. With so many federal workers ordered to stay home or work without pay, the economic pain in D.C. grows daily. Across the street from the now closed National Zoo, okay. the baked by Yael Bakery suddenly has far fewer customers, but just as many bills to pay. Well, it's certainly terrifying. Um, I have three dozen people on staff, so I have to take care of them and our customers, and I have to keep business moving. I think some people have the luxury of 
surviving without a paycheck, but I don't. My staff certainly doesn't. All right, pizza bagel on plane, and what else? Still, knowing they're all in this together, the bakery now offers free coffee and sandwiches to furloughed federal workers. Welcome back to the Federal Drive with Tom Temin, Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. At the Federal News Radio, with its target audience, government workers, you bet it's the headline every day. This is so narrowly focused on immigration. How bad is it? What's the way out? When will it end? And why does this happen so often? There were shutdowns in 78, 82, 83, 84. Says host Tom Temin, if this shutdown goes on as long as the president has hinted, maybe for months. I think people's credit ratings could be permanently harmed and you might see people having to give up their homes. Her parents are affected by this too, yeah. Now consider the plight of Sonny Blaylock, a non-government worker laid off because her company's client was the government. Her husband's in the State Department. He's now forced to work, but without pay. They're spending their savings to pay the bills. I'm sad, I'm frustrated, I, I feel powerless, and you know I don't have too many options other than hold out for hope that there will be some kind of a negotiation. All because, she says, of a political tantrum that's left hundreds of thousands like her in this country paying the price. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Paralysis in Washington, the media and federal workers stuck in the middle of this political brinksmanship, and a president whose credibility with his base is on the line. Our U.S. political insiders have a lot to talk about with this one. We'll get to them in about 20 minutes. Well, for the fourth time in less than a year, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is in China tonight. Now, there aren't a whole lot of details about exactly what he's doing there, but it's one more sign the so-called hermit kingdom is coming out of its shell. And CBC News has learned about more talks. These ones, secret. They involve North Koreans on Canadian soil. And the Trudeau government made it happen. Katie Simpson explains why. North Korean propaganda shows its normally reclusive leader heading out on his very public trip to China. Kim Jong-un is in Beijing for three days of planning talks ahead of another anticipated summit with U.S. President Donald Trump. The ultimate goal for the West is to denuclearize Kim's erratic regime. And CBC News has learned Canada quietly spent time this fall pushing that same message. I think it's always positive when Canada engages on these important issues. Global Affairs hosted five North Korean diplomats for two days of rare meetings last September. A government source says Canadian bureaucrats used the face-to-face -face talks to promote denuclearization and human rights. But no further talks are planned, and Canada will not try to re-establish normal diplomatic ties with Pyongyang. I suspect in the big picture, Canada's ability to move mountains on this file is, uh, is limited, to say the least. Canada severed its diplomatic relationship with North Korea in 2010, after Pyongyang was blamed for the deadly sinking of a South Korean warship. Since then, Kim has terrified the world with nuclear weapons tests and threats of violence. But if Canada wants to be a part of the solution, former diplomats argue it must further reopen lines of communication. If we don't see for ourselves, that means we have to rely on other people telling us what's happening. And that's, hey, we're a G7 country. The government won't say what North Korea wanted out of the meetings or whether it believes if Canada's message was even delivered to the Supreme Leader himself. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, a small anti-pipeline blockade on a BC forest road has escalated to dozens of demonstrations across Canada and beyond. After last, last night's dramatic teardown of that blockade and the arrests that came with it, Indigenous elders met with the RCMP today. But the issue is more than just a fight between the community and the police, or even the community and the pipeline company. It has divided the Wet'suwet'en First Nation itself, the country too. And now the situation is at an impasse. Renee Filipponi begins our coverage tonight from Smithers, BC. So thankful that you could all come together here today in support for the Wet'suwet'en and the Gixan. For many, the fight over the pipeline is a fight over control of their own traditional territory. It's not what we expected from Canada. This hereditary chief is angry about how things went down yesterday. 
We have a right to stand up. We have a right to say no. They have no right to listen to industry and being ordered in to treat our people the way they did. This is sovereign Wasudan land. You are trespassing. Under arrest. Get down. It was a chaotic scene. 14 people were taken away from a blockade in handcuffs. Many fled to another camp further down the forest road, which also falls under the court injunction. We uh, have to enforce the injunction as per the Supreme Court of BC, and that was our job yesterday. This has been very, um, you know, very discouraging, and, and it was a last resort. This spokesperson for the pipeline company says it spent years consulting with First Nations. We understand that there are those that don't share our point of view, but like I said, we want to ensure that all of those lines of communications remain open so that we can find a solution to this issue as safely and as peacefully as possible. The pipeline has become a very divisive issue with many hereditary chiefs against it and the elected band council behind it. I spoke with the elected chief of the Wet'suwet'en First Nation who supports the pipeline but declined an interview because she says speaking out right now would only add fuel to the fire. This pipeline is part of the massive LNG Canada project. The Heisla Nation in Kinemat signed on years ago. This MLA was band chief then. So our people could get employed, so they can get training, so they could have a different future, you know, in contrast to what I grew up in. But for the people here, no matter how big the economic benefit, it will never be worth it. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Smithers, B.C. There was a big show of support for the Wet'suwet'en First Nation at rallies across the country today. In Vancouver, hundreds of demonstrators took to the streets, shutting down traffic for hours. But in Calgary, their supporters were met by those on the other side, people who want that pipeline to go ahead. Meanwhile, further east, hundreds more marched through downtown Toronto, and in Montreal, protesters rallied outside the Prime Minister's constituency office. But Rosie, the uh, protest with perhaps the most direct impact today was one in Ottawa. Yeah, that's right, Andrew, and it was directed squarely at the Prime Minister in this case. As David Cochran tells us, it pushed Justin Trudeau's meeting with Indigenous leaders to a different venue altogether. <laughs> A meeting about reconciliation derailed by an act of resistance. We can't keep doing this. You either respect us or you don't. And there is no fine line between it. Dozens of protesters, both anti-pipeline and pro-Indigenous rights, pushed their way past security and occupied Ottawa's old city hall to protest a pipeline in British Columbia. It took courage to break through those doors, man. They marched here from Parliament Hill, a display of the problems the Prime Minister will face as he tries to build a pipeline of his own. The occupation forced the hasty relocation of Justin Trudeau's meeting with First Nations leaders to a separate government building across the downtown. This is uh, an important meeting uh, for me and I know for all of you as well. Trudeau has made improved relations with Indigenous people a core priority of his government. They are still many hurdles to overcome, many challenges we will work on together. But you know that in this government, you have a partner. But he's also made the Trans Mountain Pipeline a core priority, which many First Nations oppose. So the images of the RCMP pushing through a barricade built by elders is a problem. He keeps saying that he's going to like reconcile with us, but that's just a bold-faced lie to me, to everyone. This demonstration is about one pipeline in one province, but the debate is national. Pro-pipeline protests have been happening all over Western Canada. Unable to get their oil to market, these trucks promise to deliver anger to Ottawa as soon as next month. Today's protests made the fault lines more apparent, the tensions more evident when it comes to building a pipeline in Canada. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. More details about the accusations against Trump's former campaign chief. Prosecutors alleging Paul Manafort shared polling data with Russian intelligence in the lead up to the 2016 election. It was revealed today in a document filed by Manafort's lawyer. Manafort is also accused of lying about his contact with alleged Russian operatives. 
we should examine the safety uh, implications of, uh, of these boxes. That is the Mayor of Toronto who's calling for a review of clothing donation bins. Last night a woman died after she got stuck in one. Since 2015 at least seven others have died in bins in Canada. The hatches are designed to keep thieves out but can trap people who lean in too far. Flights at London's Heathrow Airport were grounded for several hours today after reports of drones in the area. The police were called in. Last month, you'll remember tens of thousands of passengers were delayed at, after drone sightings at another London airport, Gatwick. Since then, UK police have been given new powers to crack down on drones. And still ahead on The National, an air travel nightmare. Left on the tarmac, then shuttled to a Mexico hotel with no food, no money, and no reservations. So, would the new passenger bill of rights protect them? Hmm, good question. Plus, a documentary series lays out a damning case against rapper R. Kelly. After years of allegations, will he face the music? And in our moment, a reminder not to underestimate the kindness of strangers. When I came out, my husband was like, you know, in your car. I was like, oh, somebody hit my car, you know? And then I thought, you know, at least I left a note. And then when we read the note, I was just so caught off guard. I actually cried. WestJet is apologizing today for a flight delay that went terribly wrong in Cancun. When it was clear the plane wouldn't be able to take off, everybody on board was told they'd be taken care of for the night. But that's when things really went downhill. It turns out new rules coming in to protect passengers from being left high and dry by airlines, they might not have made a difference. Catherine Cullen explains. Please help us. Please help us. That's a WestJet passenger begging a bus driver not to leave them in a parking lot in Cancun. A far cry from the happy vacations the 134 passengers had been enjoying. When it was time to head home to Ottawa, the delays began. At the airport, uh, everybody was tired, um, hot. We had already been sitting on an airplane for four hours and 45 minutes. WestJet says there was a mechanical problem. Passengers were eventually taken to hotels, only for many to find they didn't have reservations. A lot of passengers didn't have cell phones. They didn't have money. They had small children with them. Um, so it was just very confusing. And you realized at that point that you had been abandoned by WestJet. WestJet initially blamed a booking partner for the hotel problem. Today, it's offering a full mea culpa. We have obviously failed them in this situation. Whether we work with a third-party provider, a supplier or not, it is ultimately WestJet's responsibility. The airline says it's contacting passengers and will compensate them for their hotel and incidental costs, but that's it. The federal government has promised more protection for passengers with a draft passenger bill of rights it hopes will be enforced by this summer. I believe it is the uh, best passenger rights bill in the world. But the plan wouldn't hold airlines responsible for weather or maintenance issues. This critic says passengers in cases like this wouldn't get any more. In terms of compensation, because WestJet claims it is a maintenance issue, passengers will be getting no compensation whatsoever. Some passengers are determined to punish the airline at least one way. I'll never step on a WestJet plane ever again. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Teleportation is where it's at. <laughs> Next on The National, Donald Trump made the case for his border wall to the country tonight. Our panel of political insiders will take a hard look at his address. Next. And remembering a great in Canadian sports journalism, tributes to Jim Taylor just ahead. All Americans are hurt by uncontrolled illegal migration. It strains public resources and drives down jobs and wages. A first for Donald Trump tonight, addressing the nation from the Oval Office. But his message, one we've heard from the president again and again, he wants a wall and he wants Congress to pay for it. Here with me tonight, Jay Shubria. He's a Republican strategist. He's in Columbus, Ohio. And Linda Tran is a Democratic strategist, and she joins us from Washington. Before we get into it, let's play a little bit more of the president's speech. Uh, let's start with this little piece here. Democrats in Congress have refused to acknowledge the crisis. And they have refused to provide our brave border agents with the tools they desperately need to protect our families and 
our nation. The federal government remains shut down for one reason, and one reason only, because Democrats will not fund border security. Of course, I mean, there's lots of fact-checking to be done throughout this nine and a half minutes. Uh, it, it is not true Democrats won't fund border security. They just won't fund the wall the way the president wants to. So do you think, uh, Jay, that this was, uh, if the president was trying to win over Americans or sell what he's interested in uh, obtaining, did, did he do the job there, do you think? Well, I think two things. Uh, look, remember, we, lot, there's a lot of us that follow the news every day. We read the newspaper, we follow cable news and here in America, so we kind of know what's going on. And we think this is the old hat nothing new to see here but uh -huh. what the president was able to do tonight was he was able to go over the media's head and goes directly into people's living rooms and talk to them about the thing that he cared about the most whether you agree with the policy whether you agree <laughs> you think he's telling the truth or he's he's got the right facts he was able to do that and that by doing that he's able to sure. set the narrative on this budget shutdown Okay, well, I mean, yes, he was able to talk to, to mm -hmm. people without a filter, but, uh, Linda, that only is successful, I think, if he can manage to convince them that he's on the right end of the argument. What, what, how do you think he did on that front? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, Rosemary. I mean, th the reality is he was talking to his base. You know, if you look at all the recent polling, the vast majority of Americans oppose the shutdown. The vast majority of Americans blame Donald Trump for the, the ongoing shutdown. And so what he was trying to do today is play to his base as he he always has and speak to them directly, uh, preaching to the choir, so to speak. And I, I assume that all of those folks that are on his side felt reassured by um, the remarks that he made. But what I would say is most notable about that clip that we just saw is the backdrop itself, the fact that he was making this extraordinarily partisan statement in the Oval Office, which has been you know, a location that other presidents before him, both Democrat and Republican, have reserved for talking about a much larger American ideals and and values yeah. and needs. I guess, I guess though you had to give him a shot. It's, it's his first address from the Oval. You had to see how he was going to use it. Jay, are you surprised that he did not, in fact, call for a national emergency in this instance? That, that the message was very much the same message that we've been hearing from him in other places. Yeah, I'm not sure that a national emergency was the right thing for him to call for, to be honest with you. I'm not sure this is the right use for the, uh, uh, your first Oval Office address. Yeah. But, you know, look, there's a, there's a lot of things that are going on right now in this budget shutdown. Linda's right. Look, they are blaming President Trump on this budget shutdown. There, that's, and we'll probably have some kind of resolution going forward pretty soon. But the fact of the matter is, the hard part for Democrats is he has framed this as a moral argument. Yes, they probably don't want a wall, but they want immigration reform. They want border security. And he is framing this as a moral uh, problem for the Democrats. And that's going to be the issue for them. Because if the, the wall is really a symbol of immigration right. reform in this country, and if the Democrats aren't on board there, that's a big problem for the messaging well, wise. Well, and in fact, now he says it doesn't even have to be cement. It can be steel now. So it, the wall, you're right, is symbolic <laughs> and changes. I want to play a little bit of Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer because they did get some equal time as well to respond. Here's what uh, some of what they had to say. The symbol of America should be the Statue of Liberty, not a 30-foot wall. So our suggestion is a simple one. Mr. President, reopen the government and we can work to resolve our differences over border security, but end this shutdown now. I'm not sure anyone uh, came out a winner tonight, but, but Linda, I wondered if that wasn't fairly effective strategically to say to Trump, we can talk about ways to improve uh, border security, but let's, let's make sure we open up the government and then start talking about that. How, how, what, are the like, what is the likelihood that will be acceptable for Republicans or even for the president? Well, I, I mean, what Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi both did tonight was point out that uh, Democrats have passed legislation um, that would open the government so that this conversation could continue and that we could get to some of the uh, specific concerns around immigration policy and border security separately. And yeah. she's, you know, he both, Sch Schumer and um, Nancy Pelosi were pointing that out today. And I would say what's really striking about everything we've seen tonight in the, in the short remarks that both uh, sides of the aisle delivered was basically the fact that there were no surprises uh, after an administration that so far has been chock full of them. Um, I think that this uh, is going to come to a resolution sometime over the next few days if both sides can get to the table and just, you know, hash this thing out. Well, Jay, did you think that what the Democrats, how the Democrats responded, do you think that that is likely to, to get the, the president to bend? Do you think there's a possibility he can save face here if he doesn't, in fact, get the wall? 
Look, they'll, they'll find some resolution in the coming days, I have no doubt yeah. about it, but uh, based, on the, based on that response, and responses are never easy, but no. the optics of that response, particular response, were awful. The two, got, two people there standing next to each other, one in silence for minutes, mm -hmm. wasn't the best choice. And then I also question, why would you choose two DC insiders to respond to the president when you, you have all these folks that have just been newly elected to Congress or someone from the states, someone that could deliver a message that actually would, that understands where America is, that might have been a better choice here on this response. That might have uh, had a lot to do with how they responded to the president. Okay, so if we could just pull back for a minute and explain to Canadians who have been following the shutdown, because there is sort of a, a spillover effect in this country, and certainly we, we try and understand it. Did, did what happened tonight from either side, did that change uh, where they're negotiating from? Did it get either of them closer together? The, you know, the president also said, we can solve this in 45 minutes. Well, if that's the case, why has this been going on for 18 days, Linda? Uh, it depends on how you look at it. I mean, for Donald Trump, um, again, he's speaking to his base, and what matters to him more than anything else is projecting strength. So sure. for him to be able to get in front of the American people, seated behind the Resolute desk, and to say, listen, it's not me, it's them, and we can get this deal done, really is in line with his brand and probably makes him feel good. Now, whether that is enough for him to feel like if he gets to the table with, um, with the Democrats and comes to a resolution and reopens opens the government. If, whether that's enough to make him feel good about it, I highly doubt it, but it at least allows him to say, look, I fought really hard. Sure. Um, this wasn't about me. Jay, what do you think? Well, I think there'll be there'll be a way in which both sides will probably be able to claim some victories in the few in the coming days, and they'll be able to open the government back, or at least a partial open uh, some parts of it too. So I think they'll both be able to claim victory, and and the speech will be cr uh, credited with that on both sides. Or criticized for it, depending or criticized. on where <laughs> <Good point. laughs> side you're coming from. <laughs> Jay Chevrea and uh, Linda Tran, thanks for making time for Canada tonight. Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Next, a six-part documentary sparks fury over R. Kelly. The rapper has long denied allegations of sexual harassment and assault. But today, prosecutors in Chicago say they're looking to hear from victims. We need actual witnesses and victims uh, to have the courage to tell their stories. The fallout, next on The National. Let's look at some of the other stories we're following tonight, live here on The National. General Motors is holding firm on its position to close its plant in Oshawa. The union representing the workers put forward proposals today to keep the plant open past 2019. All of the options were firmly rejected by the company, but the union, Unifor's president, vows to keep fighting. We are not accepting the closure of our Oshawa facilities under any circumstance. GM says it's asked Unifor to work with the company on transition support for the 2,600 workers who will lose their jobs. Michael Spavor has received a second visit from Canadian consular officials. He's one of two Canadian men being detained by China, accused of endangering national security. At this stage, no further details about the visit have been released. Canadian officials have been pushing for more access to the two men and for information about the conditions of their detention. For years, many R. Kelly fans have ignored the R&B singer's questionable behavior. But a new documentary is testing that loyalty with accusations of predatory behavior, mental and sexual abuse from multiple women. The allegations appear to be gaining traction. Critics are calling for Kelly's music to be silenced. And as Tashana Reed tells us, Kelly's reputation may finally be catching up with him. When I think I can't really talk about being abused, it's, it's like, it brings back memories and it's, it's very painful. Black women. The documentary is new, but the allegations aren't. They go back two decades. But the six part series may mark a tipping point. Some American radio stations have banned R. Kelly's music. I hope there is some justice done to him. While celebrities are speaking out against him. And this evening, prosecutors in Chicago encouraged victims to come forward. We need actual witnesses and victims uh, to have the courage to tell their stories. I know nobody in the history of popular music has left as many young women devastated in their wake as Robert Kelly. And what's especially horrifying with Kelly's story is these girls were consistently 15, 16, 14. Jim DeRogatis uh, published the first investigation for the Chicago Sun-Times in 2000. 
For the last 18 years, he's interviewed dozens of alleged victims, covered lawsuits and settlements, Sir. including the infamous child pornography case. R. Kelly was accused of having sex with an underage girl on video. He was acquitted. The evidence is incontrovertible, and yet uh, law enforcement has failed. Uh, American justice has failed. I believe I can fly. Despite the allegations, R. Kelly continued to release hit records and work with music's biggest names. Activist Kenyette Tisha Barnes says the industry turned a blind eye. We live in a culture where to be black and female is kind of the, low of the, the lowest of the totem pole when it comes to activism and advocacy. Barnes is the co-founder of Mute R. Kelly, a campaign that encourages fans to boycott his music. We can't have our entertainers using the, their power and influence to groom vulnerable young women and then the the capital by indifferent fans to buy them out of accountability. R. Kelly says he is innocent, but tonight it appears police and prosecutors in at least two states are considering investigations. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. And up next on The National, a stranger's good deed sparks this moment of disbelief for one mom in Newfoundland. So my husband crossed the road before me and my son and he said, oh my God, Kayla, you had a flat tire and someone pumped it up. And I said, what? So I was like, wait, I had a flat tire and then someone pumped it up? <laughs> what happened next is tonight's moment. But first, Canadian sports fans and journalists saying goodbye to a legendary figure. Veteran sports writer and commentator Jim Taylor has died. Well, everybody I've talked to says, let him go suck an egg. Jim Taylor was a superstar in Canadian sports journalism, opinionated, passionate, funny. They say he could make a grocery list entertaining, and he wasn't afraid to make fun of himself. One of his favorite stories was how in the 50s, when he reviewed records for the Victoria Times, he predicted how some wannabe rock and roller named Elvis would never make it. In 65, he moved to Vancouver to be a sports writer for The Sun and later The Province before becoming a nationally syndicated columnist and a popular guest on sports panels, including on this network. And in Vancouver, Jim Taylor. They have finally ticked off the fans to the point where they're saying a pox on both your houses. He was also a prodigious author with books on Wayne Gretzky, Rick Hansen, legendary CFL players and more. And for many, he was a friend and a mentor. Like, I remember once when uh, I was quite young and I ran into the sort of misogynistic views of let's say a uh, old school football coach and uh, JT as we called him he said uh, don't worry don't give up what that, what that guy thinks and just always remember you get to cover sports have some fun. Just an excellent person and a really nice man and he treated even the underlings and I was one of those once in my career just getting started with the utmost respect and would always have time to talk to you. Even after retiring in 2001, he kept writing. Friends say his emails felt more like new material he was trying out. Jim Taylor died Monday at the age of 82 at Shawnigan Lake on Vancouver Island. She killed her mother with an axe. Cosmo Crabtree! A convicted murderer escapes. Are you the ones that let Annabella go? Blood. The moment she was convicted, she swore to kill every person responsible. Still think she's so innocent? Murder Mysteries. Monday at 8 on CBC. Well, truth be told, Tommy, I think we would all be better off if you were never born. Yeah, yeah. Well said, Loli. When Kayla Lazaro found a note on her windshield wiper, she assumed the worst, that someone had hit her car in the parking lot, but instead she was in for a big surprise. She actually had a flat tire. That's not the good news. A complete stranger pumped it up for her, then left her a note, so she turned to social media because she wanted to find the man who helped her. He saw her post, and they met up today, and that moment is our moment. Hello, Mr. Hi, Pat. How are you? It's so nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you, too. Thank you so very, very much. You're welcome. I am so, so, so appreciative. <laughs> we read the note. I was just so caught off guard. I actually cried, honestly. I did. Okay. Everybody I know uh, that knows you has said, not surprised by this at all. This man is genuine and kind, and, and so that speaks volumes to your personality. Uh, I appreciate that from everybody. I was raised right. <laughs> Kudos to my folks. I didn't know I had a flat tire. And that's why I looked, I was like, they look like new tires. <laughs> they are. And 
And I noticed the child seat in the back. Yeah. I'm like, you know, she's going to have a kid and yeah. I'll blow it up. I'm surprised that everyone's so surprised. Why wouldn't you do it? This is so much negativity in the world and I thought you really need positivity. You need positive stories. There should be a good news segment. Pay it forward, do things for other people. Karma's real. This man's going to get some really good karma. It just really made my day. It made my week. It made my month. There is a good news segment. Gosh darn it. This is it. There, there go. we go. <laughs> we've, we've lifted everybody's spirits and we've made you pay it forward someday in the future. Yeah. Well, I, and you know, despite what, uh, what Rod was saying about how he can't believe people are surprised, I suspect anyone who's not from Newfoundland may <laughs> indeed be surprised that that <laughs> happened at all. Except here's the, the nice little touch, right? That on the Facebook post that was kind of explaining everything about what happened, uh, Rod said, you know, or I should say a lot of people were not surprised, I'm trying to make sure I get this right, many, many people were not surprised that Rod did this because it's just such, you know, so much in his character uh, that he would do a good deed. And I, I just imagine those cynical, grumpy people out there, you know, the ones that we hear from on Twitter, and what would they be saying right now? And maybe it's like, what's the big deal? So the guy just pumps up somebody's tires, and, but, but look at how happy Kayla was when he did that. Fairly simple act, but it made her day, and, uh, and hopefully at least some of the people who are watching our Good News segment, it made their day as well. That is The National for Tuesday, January the 8th. Good night. Good night.